Okay, hi guys, and welcome to today's show. Today, a triple diver watch special. Uh, in a moment, I'm gonna review the Doxa and of course my latest acquisition, that beautiful little, the pinky, the pink Tudor Submariner. And not only that, I have got my hands on a Orient Saturation Diver, which I'm very, very excited about. Now, unfortunately, I haven't got a lot of time to sit and chat. I've got to go off to a business meeting, hence why I'm uh, not in a Lacoste shirt today. <laughs> but, so I'm gonna shoot off in just a moment, but of course, let's, oh, I've gotta do wristwatch check. Got to do wristwatch check. Uh, I've decided to wear the little Tissot Janeiro. I love the vintage charm. It is faux vintage, but faux vintage done ever so well. A Doughty so limited edition, chronometer certified chronograph there. Uh, very, very 1930s style with that. Ah, just, just gorgeous. Anyway, so wristwatch check done. Let's roll the intro and get into today's video. So, the Orient Saturation Diver. Now, this has come about, a friend of mine has had this watch for over a year. It's been sitting in a drawer, hasn't been used. I mean, it's pristine condition. For some reason, he took it off the, uh, the bracelet. He doesn't know what he's done with the bracelet. So, that, <laughs> so he gave it to me. He said, you know, review it. Uh, set, you know, he's going to sell it. So I will be selling this particular piece. Um, but I, he thought, well, I might as well review it first, uh, but just have a look at that. I've put it on uh, the uh, TGV NATO strap to kind of match that polar black and white monochromatic color theme. There is a little pop of red there on the dial. It has got a power reserve, and I've got to say, the, the bezel action, it's a, it's a beautiful ceramic bezel, you can see there but the bezel action oh it's it's something else um, it's a big big piece but I've always wanted to get my hands on one of these um, it's obviously too big for me but it's very fun all the same just to have a look at I'm sure you guys will enjoy me reviewing it uh, and then after I've done the review my my uh, my friend has entrusted me to sell it so hopefully a view of the show will uh, be able to um, give it the, the use uh, it deserves. Off the bat, I can certainly say it's a step up from your ordinary audience. I know next to nothing about this watch, so it's gonna be really fun learning about it, but wow, look, at, look how thick it is. But the quality, oh my God, that bezel. That bezel, and the loom is already bright even in this well-lit room, so I'm very, very excited about that. Oh, that action to it, oh, I can't wait to to review that. So, guys, stay tuned for the full review of this. Very, very excited. So, guys, stay tuned. Anyway, um, without further ado, let's change perspectives and have a closer look at the Doxa and, of course, my little darling uh, Rolex. No, not Rolex. <laughs> it's a horological Freudian slip there. The Tudor, the Tudor Submariner, the Pinky. Uh, so, let's go ahead and do that. Today, we are reviewing not just one uh, automatic Swiss made diver, but two. And I basically decided to do them together because it just demonstrates the incredible variety you can get with what is essentially the same movement. So on the left, we have a Doxa Sub 750T, uh, limited edition, the Caribbean Sea Hunter. And the Caribbean refers to the color of that dial, that very striking blue, beautiful blue. Uh, dial. This is limited to 250 pieces. This is actually number 84 out of 250. Uh, lent in by my good friend Wayne. So big shout out to my good friend Wayne there. And then on the right we have uh, my personal latest acquisition. This is 
the Tudor Submariner. This is the mid-size version. This is the reference 75190. From my research, this is from about 1998. Uh, now, as I said, they are both essentially two Swiss-made automatics, both in stainless steel, as you can see, and they both have the same ETA, the 2824-2, but it's just so amazing how differently this movement has been utilized by these two incredible brands. And these two brands are both equally uh, renowned for their divers. We all, we all know and love um, Tudor, who's featured heavily on my channel. I'm a big, big Tudor fan, as you guys know. And Doxa is equally renowned for their divers. In fact, actually, they only do divers. So let's start with looking at the, the Doxa because it really is a fascinating brand. Now, Wayne was kind enough to forward me a beautiful book. I've, I've been meaning to feature Doxa on the channel for a long, long time. Um, their divers are fairly legendary amongst professional divers. Now, they were founded all the way back in 1889. Initially, they made only dress watches, but then in the 60s, they decided to make um, to switch to only divers. And they consulted with the world-renowned uh, Jacques Cousteau, of all people, and many, many uh, professional divers. And after a lot of research, they came up with the legendary Sub 300T, uh, which is an ancestor of the piece you see here. And as you can see from the book, Docs are very famous for using that quite dazzling uh, bright orange, which you'll see in the watch as well. Uh, it's just a, a common color theme. From their own research and consulting with people like Jacques Cousteau, they decided that orange was the most visible in murky water. And you'll see it in a lot, a lot of dive and they were actually the first uh, watchmaker to, to make an orange-faced dive watch, and that was the Sub uh, 300T 1967. The, another first uh, for the watch was that they were the first company to use or include the uh, no decompression times included in the, in the bezel, which you'll see here. And that is an also another telltale sign uh, and very unique to Doxa. It's something they do on pretty much all of their divers. Uh, you'll see that in the contrasting finish, the traditional 60 minute counter on the inside. On the outside we have the no compression um, times uh, on that polished section. And also another first and one of the most historic achievements was in the Conquistador line, they were actually the first watchmakers to include a helium release valve in their divers, quite astounding. Now, uh, this is referred to as the Caribbean, which, which um, is in reference to that beautiful, absolutely stunning kind of royal blue dial. This is only in the Caribbean models. And basically, uh, they do a very cool thing of their different models have the names are derived from the dial color. So that the diving star has a yellow face, the Caribbean, as you see, has the blue, the Sea Rambler has a silver metallic, uh, the Shark Hunter has a black, and then the orange is the professional, probably the most iconic of all. The 750 refers to its uh, water resistance. This is 750 meters uh, water resistant, which is quite staggering, and of course makes sense because we have this quite large case, uh, significantly larger if we just hold it side to side to the mid-sized Tudor there. The difference is dramatic. However, inside we still have the same ETA, which we mentioned earlier. Let me just get the specs of the ETA out of the way. Both of these divers reviewed today utilize the ETA 2824, uh, both standard versions, I believe, uh, 25 joule movement, 28,800 vibrations an hour. We're talking 38 to 40 hours power reserve, both of them the date complication at the three o'clock. These movements have manual wind and of course are hackable. They've featured so many times and countless uh, watches that we featured on the channel. They're just very reliable, affordable to, uh, to repair, extremely robust movements of the workhorses of the ETA line. So the first thing you'll notice about the Doxa is that striking case. I've heard it referred to as a kind of UFO, um, style case. It's a little bit like the Ortavia or Tivia, I can never remember, the, you know, the uh, Tag Heuer cases, that cushion case. 
uh, has a slight curvature to it, uh, very, very big. Let's just quickly get the dimensions out of the way. We're looking at a 44 millimeter diameter, about 13 millimeters thick, and then lug to lug, we're looking at 47. The lug width is 20. Quite a large, substantial piece. And let me just quickly do a wrist shot. Comes on this beaded bracelet with flanked by uh, polished links. These are three piece links quite nicely made uh, unfortunately they do have pins this is an older watch a little bit dated by today's standard typical clasp with the doxa logo of course i did a wrist shot when i did the unboxing guys check out the packaging uh, i'll leave a link up there quite astonishing packaging i really liked how it was packed this is a big watch and it's very very heavy as well far too big for me i've only uh, worn it a, a few times i took the bracelet off and wore it on a nato and, and still it was quite you know top heavy as as you'd imagine but for a dive watch you know it's deliberate you want something that's e legible and easy to see and easy to grasp which it certainly is now the weight we're talking about 187 grams compared to the little um tudor here which is only 93 grams quite a dramatic difference however the construction the quality we've got a, a, a screw down case back uh, screw down crown on both of them of course we don't have crown guards but it is recessed uh, crown there beautifully machined i love the contrasting a high polish and brushed on the top but what definitely is the standout feature on pretty much all the doxas is always that 120 click uh, unidirectional bezel it's very very solid and you'll notice the edge is kind of like a saw blade and it's it's directional, so it's each little part is, is pointing clockwise, and that's designed very specifically for that ergonomic grip. If we just go in right close, you can see what I mean there. Beautifully done, lines up perfectly, really nice solid feeling to it, very robust. And the way it just sits there on top of the case, signed crown of course, very very nicely done. Uh, the quality certainly is there. Now, recently, the, the prices of these has shot up. This is a limited edition, so I can't really give a precise price on this. And considering there's only 250 pieces out there, I doubt, you know, it's, it's probably going to end up costing uh, more or less the same as the little Tudor luxury piece here. So we have flat uh, sapphire glass with uh, anti-reflective coating, of course. And just look at that dial, that very legible dial. This watch is designed as a tool, designed for legibility. We have that super luminova. In fact, actually talking to super luminova, let's quickly have a look at the loom shot. Now, as you can see, the loom is super bright. In fact, it's so bright, my camera is having a difficult time <laughs> focusing on it. Uh, very responsive, lasts a long time, everything you'd expect. And what I love is th those hands, so easy to distinguish the minutes from the hour, from the seconds, which is a fundamental requirement of a dive, especially if you're using the, d the bezel, uh, the dive time bezel. I love that big uh, pip on the uh, 12 o'clock on the bezel. It's a really good loom on the doxa. Anyway, let's take it back to the studio. Okay, welcome back guys. And continuing looking at that dial, it has a kind of crosshaired uh, details on it and the way the uh, doxa automatic is written there, off-centered and then kind of balanced with the uh, name of the model there. The date at three o'clock, mirrored by that indices there. I love the hands. These are referred to dwarf hands. I'm not sure exactly why they're called dwarf hands, but they have this very 70s boxed uh, um, style to them. I love how the uh, lettering on the uh, no compression times matches the hands there. Beautiful but subtle touch. We have the Doxa logo on the back, beautifully uh, engraved. There is a diver extension as well, which is nice. Very, very dated by today's standard with a little bit of micro adjustment there. It needs to be bashed up. It needs to be scratched. It needs to be used. This is a watch made designed for divers. I'm not saying the Tudor isn't, but the Tudor is a completely different animal. It's quite staggering how different they really are. But it's really fascinating to see how uh, a, a use for a watch is interpreted by two brands in such a dramatically different way. So let's have a look at the Tudor now, which uh, you couldn't get more <laughs> of a different diver. It's, it's quite staggering. This is the reference. 75190. This is from about 1998. Uh, this is a used piece I bought 
recently and of course we have that salmon pink dial so again we have stainless steel but dramatically different in size actually let's quickly get the dimensions while we're talking about size looking at 36 millimeters in diameter has a beautiful thickness of only 10 just over 10 millimeters lug to lug we're looking at 42 and then the lug width is 18 so once again if you want to see the, the packaging in the box have a look at the unboxing I'll leave a link up there so we've mentioned the movement uh, which is pretty standard for the Tudor Tudor as you guys know is a sister brand of Rolex. The history of the Submariner runs parallel pretty much to the Rolex Submariner. The first Tudor Submariner was released all the way back in 1954. In fact, actually the Tudor website, the official Tudor website has a really cool page dedicated uh, to the history of the Tudor Submariner and it's quite a prestigious line of divers in itself. Uh, they were issued to many militaries over the years, especially during the 60s, I believe. And then, of course, in the 60s, the uh, Snowflake was born. But then in the 90s, with the release of the 79190 reference, we saw a return to the Mercedes hands and these triangular markers, as you see here. This basically is just a mid-sized version uh, of that reference. Now, that reference was the last of the Tudor Submariners before the great revival with the Tudor uh, heritage black bays that we all know and love so well uh, of the recent years so we're talking late 90s which is great because this particular reference has all the updates like the sapphire glass as you see and the newer bracelet which uh, if i can show you let me find that there you can see it has the screws instead of the pins holding it together although the um clasp is very very dated by today's standards we, we don't have any diver extension or any, anything like that we do have micro adjustment but you, you basically the earlier models you would have had the actual rolex clasp and rolex on the crown we do have the holes the drilled lug holes which is really really nice basically this is the last of the submariners and the submariners were released in three sizes full size which is the 39 millimeters like the 79 190 and then this version which is the mid-size version of that and then there was the mini sub which is even smaller and i believe there's an even smaller one at that which is the ladies i think the mini sub is about 33 and then i, I I'm, I'm not sure but i think this is like a, a ladies 20 something uh, millimeter one as well but i'm not not sure about that but what i love about this particular version is that stainless steel uh, insert instead of the aluminium insert on the bezel the only downside is as you can see there's it does attract little kind of scratches and dents it reminds me of the yacht master which as you guys know i re reviewed a yacht master not too long ago and i was really really impressed with it so we have a 120 click bezel which has a quite a refined feeling it does remind me a little bit of the uh, rolex submariner funny enough this bezel the action to it is executed better than the bezels on the new Black, uh, Heritage Black Bay, which is quite surprising. So we have the Oyster case, uh, stainless steel with uh, polished on the sides, brushed on the top, and this uh, style is repeated. It's not quite a Jubilee, it's Jubilee-esque, but actually I've got to say, this is superior to the Jubilee bracelet. This construction is certainly better, got a nice taper to it. I really prefer it to the Doxa, but that's just personal preference. I love this because it's very light. It's basically a little bit like a dress watch, but has uh, the bezel and, and, and sportiness of a diver. Beautiful action of the bezel, the oyster case, uh, all the rest of it, the, the dial, Mercedes hands even. It's all things that have been acquired from Rolex basically, as, as we all know, I mean, it's very obvious. Uh, but that just goes to show why Tudor are so great because they're a more affordable version of the uh, its bigger brother. The history of the Submariner in many ways is I wouldn't say equally as prestigious, but has achieved a kind of notoriety, especially, you know, the, the military uh, versions of the Submariners, uh, the Tudor Submariners, that is. The collectability, the demand is there. They do very, very well on the used market. And also, you're getting that DNA, that Rolex DNA, that quality, that experience, that uh, uh, level of detail. And from what I understand, even the hour markers are actually uh, white gold 
uh, similar to the Submariners, of course. And just look at that dial, that beautiful salmon pink. It changes dramatically in different light. It has that lovely sunburst rayed effect that, that shines out from the center. It's a definite pink, but coppery in tone. Uh, masculine enough to, you know, I mean, if it was too pink, it'd be a bit too feminine, but I think, uh, I think salmon pink is that beautiful balance. It, it's, you know, you, it goes so well with uh, blue clothes and all the rest of it. It has a dressy appeal. And ironically, uh, pink is also very, very legible underwater. So it's uh, quite usable too, um, which, <laughs> which is another hidden benefit. We have uh, 200 meters uh, Submariner written there, which of course is its water resistance, 200 meters. Uh, screw down crown, of course. The loom has lost its charge, but it has developed this lovely patina. If we look real close, you can see it's developing a nice creamy texture. It does hold a little bit of uh, charge. Um, there is loom in the pip as well. And of course we have the Cyclops with the date at the three o'clock. Although it is the same movement, as the doxa when we unscrew the screw down crown and we wind it it does feel more refined so i i don't know what you would have done to this that is a definite step up in quality compared to the doxa but that's to be expected because we have that uh, rolex uh learnt mastery of of, of watchmaking um inherent in the Tudor brand, obviously. I really am a fan of this bracelet. It's very, very comfortable. In fact, let's quickly do a wrist shot. But as you can see, on my tiny little wrist, it fits perfectly. In fact, actually, it's a little bit tight for this side um, because this wrist is a little bit thicker than this one. Uh, but interestingly enough, I also have wearing the, uh, the mid-size Seiko SKX today, another diver, and you can see that the size is very similar. But what is nice is this is the slenderness of this watch. That slight curve to the case hugs the wrist. It wears like a dress watch. It's light and comfortable. And you know what? I think because of that uh, salmon pink dial, I think it'd be marvelous to wear with a suit. I know it's a faux pas, but I really do think it's a dressy little number. And it's a dial color that I never imagined in a million years I'd uh, grow to love so much. In fact, I, I'm enjoying it so much, I'm considering a, um, a date just with, with the salmon pink dial. It's just so fun. I'm, why more watches and I don't have salmon pink dials? I just don't understand. But very, very cool indeed. Loving it. Whether it will be stay or go, I have no idea. But I just had to get it in, experience it, review it, because... You know, the Tudor Submariners, there, there is a discontinued model. Obviously, this limited edition from Doxa is also uh, discontinued. So two watches that I, I definitely can see going up in value. Uh, the Tudor probably a little bit more just because of the increasing demand for them. The midsize uh, isn't as uh, lusted after as the full-size 39mm one. Having said that... Um, I think, you know, with smaller sizes, definitely coming more in vogue, uh, especially in New York and, and, and you know, uh, kind of quite fashionable places. That trend, I think, will permeate outwards and more people will, will start to enjoy smaller watches. What a, what a pair. What an incredible two divers. I don't think I could wear the mini sub. I think 33 millimeters is just too small, even for my standards. If you've got smaller wrist I would, I, and you're considering a even a Rolex Submariner, have a look at the uh, mid-sized Tudors. I think they're, they're going to skyrocket, piggybacking to a certain extent on their larger brothers. Accuracy-wise, out of the two, the performance is about the same. I, you really can't uh, differentiate too much between uh, these ETAs. At the end of the day, they, they are the same, essentially the same movement. And if you regulate them, uh, there's no reason they can't perform uh, within COSC parameters. You know, I've never had any issues with the ETAs. I, I adore them. I think they're great, great movements. Um, so accuracy-wise, they're pretty much the same. Anyway, guys, I'm gonna leave it there. Uh, let's take it back to the studio. So I thought I would just end the video with a brief summary of the pros and cons. So the Doxa, well, let's start with the positives. First of all, there's no doubt that they have an incredible history to them. Their design is unique, bold. Uh, it's a diving icon to a certain extent. Not the most recognizable, but certainly it has its own character and I really respect that. It's extremely well made. It's extremely robust. 
it is something built for task and those are definitely all the positives of the Doxa. And lastly, it's the product of decades of um, tweaking, of improvements and you can feel that with the watch. The negatives, well obviously it has that Marmite effect. If you're into tooly, really tool divers, masculine bold divers like that, you're gonna love it. If you're not into it, obviously it's gonna have that Marmite effect. Uh, probably I, I predict more than, than other watches. Also it's big and therefore it's clumsy. It's not the lightest of watches, it's not the most comfortable thing in the world and I could imagine, I mean I, I didn't really wear it for that long but I can imagine after a while it might get a bit tedious, especially if you're not used to wearing something that big. That stamped clasp and direct extension, very very dated by today's standard. The ETA its price, is it really justified? I know this is a, uh, an argument or discussion that's been going on for, for years. Is it worth paying that much for an ETA, uh, for an ETA? I mean, and the same could be said about the Tudor. So let's summarize the Tudor now. Let's look at its positives. Well, obviously we get that Rolex style, that Rolex quality, that Rolex feel to a certain extent, especially with that bezel. It's super cool and unique with that pink. It's not your typical uh, diver watch dial color. And I gotta say, I've been converted. I, I, I'm looking at more <laughs> dials, more pink dials now because I honestly think it's hugely underrated. Why aren't there more watches with pink dials? I really love that dial color. It's stylish, it's elegant, it's got a bit of pizzazz without being gaudy or, you know, it, it's, it's in good taste let's say, it's in good taste. Also you're kind of getting a little bit of that Yacht Master feel but without paying the Yacht Master prices which is always a good thing, right? Biggest uh, plus of the, of the Tudor Submariner has got to be its collectability. It's a watch that is in demand. Sure, this is the mid-size version, not as popular as the full size but I, I can't see why it's not gonna uh, become just as collectible and just as lusted after as the full size. Uh, and guys, never be afraid of the mid-sizes. I know the kind of mainstream pop culture appeal is more to the larger sizes, but honestly, it's relative to you. If you've got the larger wrist, obviously it's gonna to be too small for you, but if you have a smaller wrist, the size has got to be relative to you. So it's minuses. Well, that kind of leads into its main minus. It's probably too small for a lot of guys, and I can totally understand that. Also, it's clasp very very dated. It's a shame they updated the the sapphire glass, the bracelet is great with the screwed links and all the rest of it uh, but why didn't they put, put a fold over in there or it just would have propelled it to, to that next, it would have been almost perfect, really would have. And lastly the same issue with the Doxa, it is at the end of the day an ETA and the same old question, is it worth paying that much money for an ETA movement? And I know we're gonna be discussing this to the end of time. Um, personally, you know I, I think it is uh, because you're paying for the luxury quality in other departments and I love the ETA, it's affordable and all the rest of it, but there are kind of negatives. You, you do kind of expect something a little bit better for that kind of money. That's pretty much the summary for both watches. Let me know your thoughts, queries, opinions, questions, all the rest of it down in the comments below. Thank you very, very much for watching. Please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it and found it useful. Now, please excuse me, guys. I'm going to dash off, but of course, hopefully, you will catch me in the next one. Okay, guys. Ciao.